Well, since everyone uh, who's supposed to be here is here, it's time for class to begin. This is your alternate class. I'm Gary Carnes, Associate Dean for Graduate Programs in the School of Business, Government, and Economics. Welcome. We're happy to see Dr. Lee's class, Dr. Schley's class, and some other staff, faculty, and some other students who aren't in those classes. Thank you so much for coming out to spend this hour plus with Mong Moon Nitzel. As you may have heard, there's an ice cream company here in Seattle <laughs> that bears her name. So she must have some involvement with it somehow. Whether well, they really paid her for the name, I don't know. It's a really cool name. Molly Moon, like you, is a passionate undergraduate student. University of Montana studying journalism. She got involved with registering young people to vote. She founded an organization called Music for America. It's going around the concerts, getting students, young people, to register to vote. And did that for quite a while. And about 10 years ago, founded Model Moon Ice Cream to have impact here by running a, an enterprise that now has seven locations, not just Wallingford. But Wallingford is really close to it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet most of you go to the amp. Yes. <laughs> Whoa! Even closer. All right. Um, fascinating story. Fascinating business model. They provide health care for the workers, living wages, and are ecologically minded as well using 100% compostable packaging. Notice we're using a compostable, recyclable cup as opposed to a plastic water bottle. <laughs> so this is livestock. Fabulous. We're so excited to have Molly Moon here today. And she's going to share with us not just her, her one school at a time changed the world, but all the other things that she's got going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, so I thought that I would make this talk about sort of my story going from being an activist to being in business and how the two, in my mind, are sort of the same. So I'm from Boise, Idaho. I went to college at the University of Montana as a journalism major, and I graduated in 2001 without enough uh, internship or externship experience to get a good job in journalism because I had been too politically active already in college and uh, no one wanted to hire me to be an objective journalist. So in my early 20s I was sort of like, hmm, I don't think I'm going to use my degree. And that might be many of your experiences and that'll be okay. Nobody that I know uses their undergraduate degree that much. Uh, so I got a job just to get a job, and I was a fundraiser for medical research at UW. I moved to Seattle in 2001 with the drummer of my favorite band, which seemed like a good move at the time. Um, it wasn't my, maybe my best decision, but whatever, it got me to Seattle. So I, uh, I got a job fundraising, and it was a great job, and I met a couple of women who really mentored me on how to be a good employee and how to be a professional in a professional environment and I will be forever thankful for that experience and one piece of advice I always give to college students is even if you have big dreams to run your own company just go get a job and work for someone else in their company or their nonprofit and learn how to be a great employee and learn what a great boss looks like so that if you are a boss one day yourself, you've, you have been in those shoes. I think that was a really valuable experience. So I started volunteering um, for a bunch of different things when I was 22 and 23, right out of college, kind of trying to fill that um, passion I had outside of work. And um, I feel old, but the presidential candidate at the time that I was passionate about was Howard Dean. He was the government, uh, governor of Vermont, and it was 2003. 
And I started, I found on the Howard Dean blog a bunch of kids who were throwing <laughs> concerts in Brooklyn, raising money for the Dean campaign and sending him the checks from the door and registering voters at the concerts. And I emailed them and I said, can I be your West Coast chapter? Can I do what you're doing in Brooklyn and Seattle and use your political action committee? So I started doing that. And uh, the Dean campaign thought we were awesome and neat. And this was sort of before um, digital political activism. And the finance chair of the Dean campaign was one of the wealthiest venture capitalists in the Bay Area. And he heard about what we were doing, throwing these concerts in Seattle and Brooklyn. And he flew up to Seattle and came to a show that I put on at Chop Suey in 2003. And he was really impressed with what we were doing, combining people's passions for a band or a few artists with their political beliefs and registering them to vote and doing issue education on issues that mattered to the young people at the, these concerts. So he flew the folks who started the organization in Brooklyn to his house. He flew me to his house. We were all about 23 years old. And he asked us, with no notice, over a week, like he asked me to fly to um, San Francisco on a Friday and I got on the plane like a few hours later. Same with these kids in Brooklyn. And then with zero notice, he asked us to pitch to him over the w weekend what a national nonprofit could look like doing what we were doing. And at the end of the weekend, he said, he and his wife said, um, you know, I think you guys really have something here. And I think you could influence the 2004 presidential elections with young voters. And if we could just increase young voter turnout by like 3%, we could probably swing the election. So I'd like to give you money to make your nonprofit a national organization and do everything that you've just dreamed up in the last 48 hours. If you make Molly the executive director of the organization. And I'm getting tingles talking about that moment right now because it was really the most life-changing moment of my life. And um, the guys that founded the organization had gone to Harvard and Yale and Duke, and I went to the University of Montana, and I was the only girl in the room. Mm -hmm. And they wanted me to lead the organization because I was well-spoken, I was passionate, I was a lot more organized than the dudes, <laughs> I have to say, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> And I think also they wanted to make a statement and have a woman lead the organization. And they really had a ton of faith in me. So the dudes were not super happy about this proposition, actually. And Andy and his wife gave us 30 minutes to decide whether or not, oh, I didn't mention. He said, in order to do this, I think it's going to take about $1.75 million. And I will give you the money tomorrow if you make Molly the executive director. So he and his wife left for 30 minutes and let us make this decision, and I stayed quiet. And finally, one of the guys spoke up and said, I think Andy's a smart guy and we need to listen to him. So that is how I became the executive director of a political nonprofit that was a national organization. We partnered with 350 bands over the next four years, we registered 90,000 young people to vote, and we increased or had a hand in increasing young voter turnout in 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007. Uh, in 2006, I got a phone call from Nancy Pelosi, who thanked me for increasing young voter turnout across the country and said that I was preparing a wave for the 2008 presidential elections. In 2007, we disbanded the organization and all of us except me went to work in some uh, Obama election related effort. I was in love and wanted to move back to Seattle and get my boyfriend to marry me and open an ice cream shop. <laughs> so I wrote a business plan for Molly Moon's homemade ice cream. My name is Molly Moon. My parents were hippies. <laughs> I now have two daughters who also have middle names of Moon, carrying it on. And 
What I had found when I ran a political organization was that I, most of my job ended up being, if, you all, and if any of you want to run a nonprofit, most of my job was asking rich people for money. And it wasn't super fun. Uh, we did good stuff with that money, but that really is a lot of the job of the head of a nonprofit. And I often felt that when I was asking for th these folks for money, they were donating to a progressive political organization because in some ways, they wanted to assuage their guilt for how they'd made all that money. Or that's the sense I was getting. And that, I didn't always feel great about that. So I moved back to Seattle in 2007, and I asked myself, what business could I start that would make me proud to make every dollar? Where I could have an impact on my community and make money. Because I kind of want to show other business people that you don't have to make money in ways you feel uncomfortable about and then spend it to make that up. And that your own values, no matter what kinds of values they are, can align with profit. And so that's how Molly Moons came to be. I love ice cream. I'm passionate about ice cream. I ate ice cream almost every night after dinner growing up, but I didn't start Molly Moons because I love ice cream so much. Ice cream is the vehicle for social change. So I said to myself, what are the things that I want to include in my business plan that I think will make the biggest difference and make the biggest statement and will be the most difficult to do and show that the company can still be profitable? So I decided that I would pay 100% of the healthcare premium for every employee who worked for us at least 18 hours a week. I decided that every single thing would be compostable. And while that sounds sort of silly now because the city of Seattle requires every place like mine to be compostable, in 2008, my paper products rep didn't know where to buy compostable spoons. They had to go to the University of Washington campus get one of their spoons and go find that paper rep because that's how rare they were even 10 years ago. Isn't that awesome how far we've come in 10 years? So I demanded that everything that leave our doors be compostable and it was actually quite hard then. And I have since um, been involved in the task forces at, the, at City Hall that have created the legislation we now have where everything has to be compostable or recyclable and we've outlawed straws. And um, I was given this when I walked in today for my speech and I refused it. And I hope all of you refuse these also and carry around water bottles. And I would encourage someone in this room to start an advocacy campaign to ban this from your campus because this is killing the oceans. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so free health care, everything's compostable living wages. At that time, I thought a good part of a customer service job with a living wage was a really positive tipping culture. So I, I tried to encourage customers to tip a lot, and I researched strategies on how to do that. I'm going to talk about tipping in a little while and how I've completely changed my mind about that. But at the time, those were sort of the beginning of, of the values, and that's how I started the company. And we were and I, was, I shouted those values when I started, when I opened my doors to the ice cream shop. And I think a lot of people supported Molly Moons from the very beginning because I was talking about those values. I will admit, I don't think the ice cream was all that good on opening day. And I now think our ice cream is absolutely the most delicious ice cream in Seattle because I have hired really talented chefs from around the country who do all the research and develop, development and make all of the flavors. But at the time, it was just me, and I was doing my very best. Uh, but I think our ice cream has gotten yummier and yummier and more delicious and more chunks in it and um, saltier, which uh, has you know, makes all the flavors taste even more over the years. 
But I think a lot of people supported my company from the beginning because we were loud and proud about our values. Uh, we've added some things that are absolutes for us over the years in terms of being socially and environmentally responsible and being impressively profitable. So we now do a 401k match. I do 12 weeks of paid family leave for men and women who bring a new child home through birth, adoption, or foster care. I do 70% of, uh, of pay for 12 weeks for um, family leave related to taking care of an elder or a sick child or a spouse. Um, we subsidize transportation for all of our employees. Something that I've learned over the years is that for some folks coming from far away or communities where, or families where a job hasn't always been a priority to their parents, um, getting to work can be uh, an obstacle that makes it okay to not show up. So we pay for the bus passes, uh, the orca passes, for everybody who works for Molly Moons, if you want it. And I'm trying to think of our other sort of absolutes we've thrown in there. Uh, matched giving and volunteering. We pay people to volunteer in their communities, um, and we match the giving that they do to food banks and to other nonprofits. I think that's the list. I might be missing some. So how am I doing this and making money? Uh, I think I have a strong brand. I'd love to hear in the Q&A session what you all think or what questions or suggestions you have for, for the brand. But I think um, a few things. I've always thought that an ice cream shop experience is more about the experience than the product. So I've designed the shops in a way that I think is fun. You're not walking into white formica and primary colors. If you're a parent, you don't feel like you're in a preschool. You feel like you're actually somewhere cooler, like you're going to a coffee shop, but you just ha happen to be with your three kids getting ice cream. Um, and if you're college students or you're young professionals, you might go there on a date. One of the things that I really thought Seattle was missing in 2008 was a place to go that was not a bar after dinner with someone you liked. And I desperately just wanted my boyfriend to take me to an ice cream shop, but not a Baskin Robbins, not somewhere with fluorescent lighting, like somewhere that kind of felt like it kept the date going. So that was a huge reason that I started Molly Moons, and I think it's been a big part of our success. Um, we try to be really, really, really smart with the strategy around product offerings, what they cost, and labor scheduling. I am detailed down to the hour of how many people should be on, in, on the floor working any shift. We have now 10 years of history of weather and um, you know days of the week to show us how we did in that hour on that day after a rainy weekend in that month, and we schedule accordingly. And then I have a really robust bonus program. So all of our managers, all of our chefs, everybody in leadership uh, is bonused on sales, profitability, team happiness, and customer happiness every 28 days. So everyone is very motivated to meet sales goals, meet profit goals, keep their, their team happy and make sure their customers are happy. And for the most part, our employees, we call them the moon crew, are very bought in to meeting those goals. And I think not just because of the bonus program, but because we are all in this together. Everybody in leadership at Molly Moons, down to the shift leaders and the ice cream makers and the scoopers, we, we all very much believe that we can make a difference and we can make people's day better and we can make the world better and we can make our Seattle community better one scoop at a time. Uh, I read a business book several years ago that has been really impactful and for any of you wanting to go into business, I would highly recommend it. It's called Drive and it's about what really motivates employees and that it's not usually money. Um, the keys to most employee motivation are around fulfillment, autonomy, opportunity to impact the world, 
and opportunity to advance their own careers. And so while a bonus program or compensation is of course a big part of paying folks and motivating folks, I think it is smaller than those other things I mentioned. And so we try very hard at Molly Moons to involve everyone in opportunities to be fulfilled, to make a difference in our community, to move up through the com company or get skills at Molly Moons that they can apply to advancing their own career in whatever path they want to take. Um, and I forgot the last one. Oh, autonomy, making their own decisions while they're at work. Those are all really important to us. So, so far it's been working out, this whole activism business thing. We're 10 years in, we do about $7.2 million a year in sales. We have a pretty healthy profit margin. We give 1% of sales back to the community through charitable giving, mostly to food banks. And we are hoping to open two more stores in the next two years. Um, so that'll be uh, 10 stores. I, as a working mom, I have two little kids. I have a five and a half year old and a nine month old, both daughters. I work about 27 to 30 hours a week right now. And I'm still able to run the company. And I encourage folks when they have families to decrease how many hours they're putting in at the office. And I continue to pay them their wage and I know that that will come back to me as their kids grow and they have more times because they'll stay with our company and help it become stronger. And so far that has been true. I'm kind of rambling now. That's kind of the story of Molly Moons. I tend to like speaking engagements the most when I spend most of the time answering questions. So I would love to, oh, I want to talk about tipping, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. So does anybody in this room, I'm going to ask you a question, does anyone in this room know the origin of tipping culture in America, or why we tip in the U.S. and don't tip in many countries outside the U.S.? Um, well, I've been told that it's considered disrespectful in Europe to tip because they're already doing their job and they're already being paid. So when you tip someone, it's saying that they're not like is it saying that they're not being paid enough. I think that's true. Um, does anybody know the origin, like why it started here in the U.S.? This is going to blow your minds. This blew my mind. So tipping was invented in Europe in the 17th century by aristocracy who went to other people's houses and then slipped their servants money as a way of showing off how much more money they had. So it was about power and about showing off. It had nothing to do with compensating a job well done for the person serving them the meal or opening the door. It was actually considered sort of gauche and rude in Europe even at the time, but like the Donald Trumps of 17th century Europe were doing it. And it never really caught on. But a few people thought, um, brought it to the US as the United States was developing as a country. And it was sort of lingering with a few folks in the deep south uh, as the United States came to be. Then, after the Civil War, a handful of white uh, former slave owners thought, I shouldn't have to pay a wage to a black person. And so I am going to not give them a wage, but give them a job and tell them that they can just receive whatever is handed to them and they should be thankful for it. Doesn't that make you feel different about tipping a server now? It has certainly made me feel different as I've learned the history. And so, 10 years ago, I wanted to create this positive tipping culture so that my employees made more money. I'm now thinking very hard about the huge amount of compensation that servers in America get through a system that was born out of racism and classism and is so sexist 
There are so many studies that show if girls are thin and show cleavage, they make more tips than if they are not and they don't. So that is, I, I, want, I, bring, I bring this up as an example that as a company with values, social justice and sustainability values at the core of who we are, you have to evolve. And some of your first tenants uh, when you start the company may really have to change as you become more aware. So we're going through a huge reconciling at Molly Moons about what are we going to do about this? And um, it'll be really exciting to watch, I think, what Molly Moons does in the next few months. OK, uh, I have lots of other examples of how we've needed to learn and pivot that I can share. But I'd love to open it up to questions, because that's my most favorite part of public speaking. So what questions do you have? Yeah. How do you think, like in your opinion, since it's your company, you guys do as far as helping families, well, supporting growing families, especially in a place like Seattle? Like, do you guys think you do a good job at helping people grow a family and making sure that they're, they're well paid? And, you know, in terms them? of Moon Crew? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, like, going up through the company. And, you know, yeah. I think that um, we can always do a better job at that, but we are far more competitive on compensation than anyone in our industry. About three or four years ago, we sort of said inside Molly Men's leadership, we want to be the raddest employer in the food and beverage industry in Seattle. And I think that we are. I think we compensate better with the full package of benefits um, than anyone else. Can you have a comfortable living in Seattle on an ice cream scooper wage at Molly Moon's and be a single parent? You can do it. I have people doing it. And I am very much encouraging them to do our program called Career Pathways so that they can get promoted and move up through our company. You can do it. But wow, Seattle's expensive right now. <laughs> Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the way, this is side note from that. That's really cool that you, as an owner, can say that because a lot of companies can't say that mm -hmm. um, about a lot of their areas. But my biggest question is um, with the with the tipping culture, because I actually saw this at one of my the plug for my last one, um, where like that was being they were trying to shut that down. What are you going to do? to present to your employees how you're going to change that? Like, how are you going to inform them? Because um, based on my experience from it, it did not go so smoothly. Yeah. 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 I want to pause for a moment and ask when this recording is going to be released. <laughs> well, um, probably not for a while. OK. Yeah. Um, can I ask you to hold it until mid-November? Yeah, I can, I can control that. Yes. OK. <laughs> Uh, I'll be having coffee with every single employee in my company uh, and personally telling them how the change will affect them and asking them for their advice and their partnership in the process. Wow, but they don't know that yet. That's a very bold thing to do. Wow, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you talk about working with your political action committee and then transitioning over to your ice cream shop in your business. Could you describe more of what inspired you to move into that different direction? I mean, it really was like I got tired of asking rich people for money. Um, and I was in love. I wanted to move back to Seattle where my sweetheart was. It's kind of that easy. Yeah. I'm going to stand up since I can't really see you. Um, you threw out a couple of buzzword in your talk, which I love. Um, you use the word social justice and values, and um, particularly around like the tipping system right, rooted in racism. I was curious, another marginalized community are folks who are actually felons and or have a criminal background who can't necessarily obtain yes. a job. 
Yeah. Do you foresee your business hiring strategically incarcerated people and or people with a felony background to help them be a sustainable human being operating in our society, particularly uh, black yes. men of color? Yes. The answer to your question is yes. Um, I can talk a little bit about our hiring strategies over the last few years. Uh, we have always banned the box. I've never asked anybody about their criminal history. I don't think it applies to whether or not they're going to be a great employee, and I think that has proven to be true over the last 10 years. Uh, we, I don't know if any of you have seen, but our hiring slogan for our hiring campaign every year is called Now Hiring Optimists. That is the number one important thing to me about a human being and definitely an employee. Are you an optimist? Can you have hope for the future? It is hard in our country right now, in my opinion, but if you can, I want you on my team. And optimism is one of the only traits that in my opinion crosses every other sort of boundary between humans. And so when we do interviews, when we do recruitment campaigns, we're just looking for optimists out there in the community in all places. We partner with 50 nonprofit organizations that work with marginalized communities, including formerly incarcerated folks, who, um, to help us advertise our jobs. In the first five or six years of my company, I mostly had rich, bougie, white kids who were going to college as employees. And what I realized was I was providing unique jobs in the service industry to kids who didn't totally appreciate it or need it. So we totally changed our hiring strategy. So now we've, we partner with these 50 nonprofits to do most of our recruitment. And um, we've also put all of our hiring managers through really serious equity training, training around their own biases, training around what it means to be marginalized, training around how folks can show up to work and change their lives through opportunity. And we've changed our hiring practices. We never interview someone one-on-one. -on -one. Two managers always sit in a room and always interview someone together. And then when that candidate leaves, they talk about the interview and they check each other on their sexist, racist, or classist biases. And then they make a hiring decision. So yes, um, we're doing a lot of work in that area. And we have folks who work for us who are formerly incarcerated. I know that anecdotally. I don't know that through the data because I don't ask and I don't care. Yeah. Uh, you've been so successful both in your business model and doing it the way, you know, it sounds like doing it the right way, the way that you want. But can you tell us about a time where it looked like maybe it was all crashing down or a fence you didn't think you could get over and how you personally were able to do that? Yes, we've had a few. It has not been all ice cream and roses. Um, the summer of 2015, was a hard summer. Two things happened. The price of heavy cream went up quite a bit. And my recipe is basically two cups of heavy cream, one cup of milk, half a cup of sugar. That's like you can go home and make Molly Moons now. That's what it is. <laughs> and so when two thirds of the liquid base of your product, the price goes up, and I think it was like, 14%. It hurt so bad, like to the tune of $240,000 that summer. Then at the same time, and I don't know how this happened or why these two things happened at the same time, our scoopers started to not understand what five and a half ounces looks like. And they were scooping scoops that were like six, seven ounces. And I was noticing mostly on Instagram, people <laughs> posting these scoops that were so huge and our scoop size got out of control and I looked at and I only make money four months a year I that's that's another like business lesson that I have had to learn in this business I make money four months a year and then I have to be really good at cash flow management until I start making money again in May or June and I looked at our bank accounts at the end of the summer of 2015 and there was not enough money to get through the winter 
And I, one, I noticed the scoop size thing in July. So we did this huge campaign within our company to try to right the ship. But I realized that, you know, one ice cream shop was like sailing. I could get the seven or eight scoopers on the team to kind of do anything anytime. At this point, we had like six ice cream shops and it felt like moving a barge. And I could not steer that scoop size you know, program to get the scoop sizes to what they should be, which is five and a half ounces, which is still an ounce and a half more generous than any other ice cream scoop in the city. <laughs> Quickly enough to save the money on cost of goods. And so we just sort of blew the summer. And I had to go beg our bankers to increase our line of credit to get through that winter. That was really, really hard. And there was no reason that the bank wanted to give me that money. We had made a big mistake. Um, and the funny thing about borrowing money from banks is they often think that they know how to run your business better than you once you've made a mistake. And so it took me years to sort of get that banker off my back. Um, and he would tell me like who I should fire, or what I should do. It, it was rough. Um, yeah, that's my best example of that. What other questions do you have? Yeah, so I was thinking like in comparison, because like Cupcake for Now is also very like active. And I feel like, do you see yourself like as Molly Moons? Because they like are very proactive in the like, go vote register, like they do a lot of campaign advertising mm -hmm. then. And do you see Molly Moons kind of doing a similar thing to that? Or do you feel like that advocacy of like being very upfront of like, getting people to vote is kind of like in your past? No, I mean, we posted on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter yesterday that it was the last day to register to vote. We have voter registration cards and stamps in all of our shops that you can ask any scooper for and they will help you fill it out. Yes, that is still a part of my life. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys do like any promotions as far as like if you vote? You'll yes, if you bring in your stub, your, yeah. your pay stub from your mail-in, or your pay stub, your stub from your mail-in ballot, we will give you a free scoop except in federal elections when that is illegal. But <laughs> when there are city and state elections, we always do that. And what about any other like, discounts? How can you guys like, You can't. Like, it's illegal. Or, it's mostly <laughs> illegal. <laughs> what about, like, and, like, uh, I don't know, anything else? Like, 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 oh, yeah. We don't do a ton of that. We don't do a ton of that. That's one of the ways where, places where I've had to decide to be profitable. Um, and we do a discount, a neighborhood discount for the other food and beverage workers in the neighborhood of the shop. So, and our, our teams kind of know who those folks are, but we don't do a lot of discounting of our product. Yeah. Let me you a question. Uh, it's interesting. It's some of what you've been able to do, you've been able to do because it's a high margin sort of business. It's more of a luxury item. How hard would it be to inculcate those values into something that was maybe a thinner margin. Could, could you honestly tell somebody you could do this in any business or is it really because of the type of business you run that you can put out your values this way? I don't really want to tell anybody what they can do in their business, um, especially an existing business because like I said, writing a ship that it is a barge is really hard. I did research, you know, I did decide to open an ice cream shop because I knew that Mostly, I didn't really understand the, how profit works in, in the, the ice cream industry when I wrote my business plan, but I did know there was zero waste because it's a frozen product. So that's one place where I save money as opposed to a restaurant. What I do think about that question though sort of in general is I think every CEO and every entrepreneur and every shareholder should be asking themselves right now, if I can't make the world better and do right by my employees and be profitable, should I be in business? Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the answer is no. You should figure something else out. What other questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. First off, I went to Molly Moons way too often when I was an undergrad here. Um, <laughs> Thank you for coming. Yeah. And um, I was just curious, you know, you, you have a background in politics and, and different things like that, and you've brought that into your business. And I'm wondering 
how that has impacted um, employer relationships and things like that if there are differing views because it's clear to me maybe what some of your views are but what if you were to hire someone who loves some of that mission but maybe can't get all the way there with maybe how, yeah. how a lot of your employees are yep. feeling or how you as a leader feel. Yep. We ran into that when I decided to create Hillary Rodham cookie dough ice cream. <laughs> So in 2016, in the summer, uh, I don't know, you, you guys are probably too young to know this story, but in 1992, when Bill Clinton was running for president, um, a woman's magazine, I think it was called, I think it was Family Circle, used to, like through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, ask the wives of presidential candidates to submit cookie recipes and they would publish both cookie recipes in Family Circle magazine, and then they would have their readers vote, and they would decide the presidential election based on the candidate's wives' cookie recipes, because <laughs> that's how we should cho choose a leader. And they asked Hillary for her cookie recipe, and she wrote back and said, you know what, I have been busy being an attorney. I don't have a cookie <laughs> recipe that is any better than the cookies that my husband could make. So here is our Clinton family cookie recipe that we have made with Chelsea. She submitted that against Bob Dole's wife's cookie recipe. I'm forgetting her name at the moment. And um, her, the Clinton family cookie recipe won. But she also made a huge statement about the differences between men and women, women, and why are we asking just women for these cookie recipes? Mm -hmm. And I loved it, and I was really touched by that moment as a 13-year-old girl with a lot of ambition. So I wanted to make a Clinton family cookie dough recipe. So a few of my employees were really uncomfortable with that flavor. And I don't have a great answer to your question because I'm just sort of living my values loud and proud. And I hope that they are loud enough that when you apply for a job at Molly Moon's, you sort of know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> just like when you apply for a job at an Amazon warehouse, you know you might have to pee in a water bottle because he's not gonna give you a bathroom break. <laughs> like, do your research. Um, I wanted to be really sensitive to the folks who disagreed with me about the 2016 presidential election. And so we created a script that they felt comfortable with, that we worked on with them about how to talk to customers about that flavor without having to get into politics. Mm -hmm. um, and a few of them were still uncomfortable, didn't even want the name of the flavor on the menu behind them that they needed to stand under all day. Uh, and that, I get it, um, that was their choice. Uh, those employees stayed, they stayed through the election season, we all got through it, we all still love each other. I think respectful dialogue when you have political um, differences is what can keep people like being friends and being employees and and still caring about each other I think it's really similar to family um, so we've navigated those waters just fine yeah uh, something as a consumer that I love is how Molly Moons has like permeated itself on Seattle culture it's like so known around Seattle and I just was wondering like how, what was the decision to open one in Redmond? And do you have ideas of expanding or just staying in the Seattle area? Because I didn't grow up around here, and so it was like the cool thing to drive into Seattle to go get Molly Moons. So I remember it was like the biggest deal when you opened in Redmond. Awesome. I'm, I love our Redmond shop. Um, I, so let's see. I do have expansion plans outside of Seattle, but not outside of the Seattle region. I have no interest in needing to get on a plane to go talk to a farmer about blueberries. And that is how I run my business. Like every ingredient is from a local farm and we have relationships with all of those farmers. And if it can't be farmed here, like chocolate, coffee, tea, then we have fair trade 
and organic partners that are local that bring those ingredients to us. So if I were to open outside of Seattle, I would need to go create 25 new farmer relationships. And with two little kids, like that's not what I'm trying to do. Um, so I think Seattle region, like if I can drive there and we can get Pacific Northwest farmers to provide the ingredients, I'm interested in those ice cream shops. But I think that Seattle is so cool that it has all of the urban villages and that there's really a downtown for every neighborhood. And I think every one of those downtowns in Seattle and in the cities around Seattle deserve a Molly Moons. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a, I'm an East Coaster and I have a friend from the South who always, um, Southerners just say things really well. And she would say, her, one of her lines is, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Yes. <laughs> um, and so my question for you is, um, it's so clear what comes up in the bucket in terms of how you practice your business, what, how, what your values are. How are those formed in your hippie family? Oh yeah. Um, and where did that come from? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Idaho, the reddest state in the nation. And I'm Jewish and I was adopted and my grandma was the chief of staff for the only Democratic congressperson to serve in the 1980s in Idaho. So um, I am a very privileged, rich white woman at this point. But when I was a kid in all white Idaho, um, I felt marginalized, I think is part of where I come from. Um, there were only 17 Jewish kids in my high school. Um, I didn't know anybody else who was adopted. And we were Democrats and we were vocal Democrats. My dad and my grandpa printed, had a screen printing business and they printed all the bumper stickers and t-shirts and yard signs for all the Democratic candidates in Idaho. And I would get made fun of and I would get teased. I was also in that congressman's um, TV campaign ads like <laughs> forever and growing up. So everybody in Idaho got to see my awkward phase in congressional ads. So um, I, I think a lot of my values have been born of feeling like I was in the minority. And then my family was super compassionate. Um, my grandmother, who was the chief of staff for the congressperson, founded the League of Women Voters in uh, the chapter in Pocatello, Idaho in the 70s. And the first speaker that she brought in was, um, or was earlier than the 70s, but was a young John Kerry just back from the war to talk to the League of Women Voters in Idaho. And she was really incredible and um, had a huge impact on my life and was always fighting for women and for folks who were not given chances because of the way they looked or where they came from. And so I think I've just kind of got that in my blood. And then my mom, that's my dad's family, my mom was the daughter of a hotel, restaurant, and bar owner who was the, um, the head of the chamber and a Republican. So I got kind of small business ownership through osmosis in my blood. And so I think Molly Moons is sort of the perfect marriage of my grandparents. What other questions do you have? Yeah. Um, I actually have two. That's Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're clearly a very passionate, driven person, and you've like done a lot and seen a lot. Um, so my question for you, <laughs> yeah, um, is, what do you like? Is there a place where that passion continues to come out unrelated to Molly Moons, or is there like something that you're like, okay, I just like need a break from caring about everything all the time? Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Do you all feel that way right now? <laughs> Yeah, so, so like, how, like, how do you do that, I guess, is my question. Like, what are your other things you do to kind of, like, take a step back? If you need yeah, to... good. That's a great question. Um, I don't really do a lot of passion projects or activism outside of Molly Moons. I have sort of made a decision, because I'm a busy working mom, to, if I care about it enough, 
then I'm going to try to impact it through my business. And it's really, I think that's a good strategy. Uh, being a female business owner and CEO in Seattle carries a weight behind your voice that I didn't have when I was an activist. Like I've been calling Patty Murray's office for 20 years. She picks up the phone now, you know? Um, she wants me to come to lunch. And that's different and that's great. And so I think, so one way that I've sort of been able to um, corral my passions is I often think like, how can Molly Moons have an impact on this? But then even more to your question, I usually think, am I doing my best for the moon crew about this issue? And if we aren't, then I'll focus on that first. Like one of the things I think every CEO should be asking ourselves is, are any of my employees on food stamps? Are any of my employees taking advantage of WIC? Are any of my employees in a place where they could receive an affordable housing voucher? If that's true, I need to probably invest more in my employees before I go out and make donations or, um, try and have a bigger community impact. That's not to say you should just focus on your own people without impacting the community. And I would say that another huge bubble of time for me is lobbying. I have spent a great deal of the last 10 years lobbying. I wrote the language into Obamacare about small business tax credits. I was the front business person on the paid safe and sick time policy for the state of Washington and for the city of Seattle. I was on the committee that passed the minimum wage increase statewide in 2016. I was on the committee that helped create the $15 an hour minimum wage here in Seattle. I uh, lobbied really hard for the Paid Family Leave Act at Washington State that goes into effect next year. And I am currently working hard on gender equity laws at, at the state level. And I've done a bunch of federal lobbying too. Uh, the second part of your question, how do I sort of like, it's all so much. Um, uh, I take breaks from the news. Um, I don't read the newspaper every day anymore, even though I think it is my civic duty to read the newspaper every day. Sometimes I just can't. So I will take a 48 hour break kind of often these days. Um, and I work part time so that I can play with my kids. And I see the goodness in the five year olds that I surround myself with. Um, and that kind of gives me hope and levity. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I ask my second? Sorry. Sure. Oh, that, that yes. <laughs> uh, I guess third, because my first one was really, anyway. Uh, <laughs> you talked a lot about branding. Uh, I used to be an art major, kind of, want to start, anyway. Uh, branding is always something that's really interesting to me, and you guys' brand, like, since moving here from California, I was like, why is there a little dog on this? This is so interesting. It has nothing to do with ice cream, but it's so, like, catchy still <laughs> and so like I was just curious how you kind of like came up with that and when you were like creating it what you're like oh like that's cool that's not like what you're defining was for that okay this is a great question and I'm gonna turn it into a poll so the story of the logo is I don't know I just I think that I'm good at marketing I've had no marketing training I didn't take one marketing class <laughs> Um, I just think I have good instincts and people have told me that and reinforced that enough that now that I'm in the boss chair, I just keep thinking it. Um, but when I was starting the company, I very clearly, like before I even finished the business plan, I was like, I know what I want the logo to be. I want it to be my puppy. Her name was Parker Posey. She was like three months old, <laughs> licking an ice cream cone. And I want Molly moons over the top and I want homemade ice cream along the bottom and I want it to be in a blue dot. I like, I totally had it. And then I had a, a graphic designer friend make that logo. There was no research behind it. There was no strategy. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I just got advice from a PR person that I trust very much. Who's working with me on some of my social justice stuff 
that I should rebrand the company and change the logo from the confusing dog to something that is more vocal about our values. Do you guys think that's a good idea? Raise your hands to keep the dog. Raise your hands to change the logo to something more social justice-y. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's, I think it's still working. Can you make the dog social justice? I don't know, yeah. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. Yeah. Okay, um, so I've got to go pick up my daughter from kindergarten in six minutes, which means we have six more minutes for questions. Yeah. Can you talk about what your company is doing or plans to do in the dying dairy market? The dying dairy market. Can you uh, the emphasis on people like trying to be trendy vegans or that? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Um, I don't think it's a dying market because um, sales of dairy products are not going down, even though sales of dairy alternatives are going up. So I'm not super worried about that. Um, I, so your question was like, what is my strategy around that? Yeah, or do you guys already do anything like, I know you guys sell vegan ice creams. Yeah. They're delicious. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Like anything in that scope of? Well, so we always have two, sometimes three vegan flavors on the menu made with coconut milk, which is very unsustainable. It takes 30 years to grow a coconut palm. Um, in order to produce a coconut. And coconuts are usually harvested by children um, who can climb the trees. So I have a lot of thoughts about vegan dairy alternatives. Most of them are so bad for the planet and most of them are harvested in ways that I don't want my children or friends to have to do. Um, our coconut milk is fair for life, which means it's not harvested by kids and it's harvested by people who are being paid a living wage, but there's not that much on the market. So um, I don't think that the demand for vegan ice cream will outpace the demand for traditional ice cream. And so I don't really have a strategy other than like to try to be ice cream for everyone. And I think right now we have a pretty good balance, though we are talking about eliminating one of our always flavors and adding vegan coconut chunk to the always menu so that there's at least one vegan flavor that's always on the menu that's predictable for people. Because sometimes we'll have three vegan flavors, but they'll be really weird, and they'll be weird ones that like kids wouldn't want, like when we have vegan horchata and vegan, um, uh, I can't even think. We'll have a weird sorbet with an herb in it, and like you bring your kid in who can't have ice cream, or who can't have dairy, and then they're super disappointed. So I'm trying to balance that line. Yeah. Yes. Oh, did you have a question? Okay. Yes, um, how do you keep like all the flavors consistent throughout the year, even though like some of the flavors are obviously not in season? But always... Great question. Um, I'll tell you the example of strawberry. So we work with a farm in the Skagit Valley called Viva Farms, which is actually an incubator. So they teach people how to farm and how to build a farming business. And many of their clients are former migrant farm workers who have all the farming skills. They just need the business skills to own their own farms or lease land to own their own farming businesses. Um, but they also incubate a lot of other interesting folks like refugees. They incubate some people who want to be farmers because they're vets and they can't live in the city anymore because of PTSD around loud noises. Uh, it's a really, really cool um, farm incubator. And we buy all of our strawberries from them. And yeah, strawberries only grow June through early September. So we rent storage, frozen storage space down in Georgetown. And we store a summer's worth of strawberries in uh, that storage space year round. And we just use them until they're back in June. And we do that for any fruit that we use. Yeah, yes, we buy all the lavender basically in August. Yeah. Well, I do not want to make Molly wait 
Oh, thank you. Uh, we have a small gift on behalf of the school oh, for you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you.